Okay, I guess I'll get started. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, just a little bit of material today. Um, only a page and only two and a half pages of text, but actually it's fairly deep. So I'm going to try and go over it slowly and carefully. I'm going to uh, sketch the proof of the Shannon capacity theorem, which tells you the capacity of a noisy channel. And then I'll talk about modeling continuous sources and I'll try to give you some historical context for why this is important. Actually, this turns out to be something that's uh, the, it's obvious for us, but it's actually very, very important as well. Okay, so let me start by going back to the same figure that we had before. So we have some um, unidirectional channel. And on this channel, we're going to send some input symbol x, which is a random variable. We're going to get some output y, which is also a random variable. And we're going to now focus purely on the channel. And we know that it's a noisy channel. So what that means is that when we send a 0 or a 1, the output is going to be probabilistically uh, 0 or 1. So if you send a 0, with some probability it comes out as a 0. But there's some other probability it comes out as a 1. And if you have 1 symmetrically, the probability is that it goes out as a 0 or a 1. And that's the definition of a noisy channel. Now, last time we looked at certain descriptions. So h of x is the entropy of the source as seen by the recipient. So the receiver doesn't quite know what symbol is being sent. And we characterize that as h of x. And we characterize the entropy uh, uh, x given y as being the entropy of the source after communication has happened. So the recipient has seen the symbol Y. And looking back, it says, OK, uh, I think that the entropy has now something H of X given Y. And we define the mutual information. I'll just write it here. I, X, semicolon, Y as being the reduction in entropy due to the transmission due to the transmission and reception of a symbol on the channel, and that's a mutual information, okay? Now, the important thing to notice is that this mutual information clearly depends on h of x, and it depends on h of x given y. So the h of x comes from the nature of the source as well as the coding. So we have some message source, and then it goes into a source coder, And this goes into a channel coder. And this combined, this combined process gives rise to x. And we claim that by appropriately choosing the channel coder, we can control p of x, the probability mass function of x. So I really should be calling it small p to be consistent with the probability chapter. But at any rate, we can control the probability mass function of the random variable x by proper choice of the channel coder. So that's the tuning knob that we have. And so we can therefore conceive of the following quantity, which is max i of x, y. We're maximizing over p of x. So in other words, there exists, certainly we can conceive of a certain uh, probability mass function p of x which maximizes i, x, y. And the interpretation of this is that this is the one, this is the p of x such that the channel is having the least distortion on it, okay, a least effect on it. And we looked at last time, we looked at the channel which had these four symbols, a, b, c, d, and if d is always being corrupted, well, let's not use d, basically. And that would be choosing the p of x, the symbols being sent on this side of the channel in such a way so that the uh, uh, th this quantity hx minus hxy or the i of xy is being maximized, okay? So that means that we can control this, okay? So Shannon's theorem basically says that this quantity over here is also the, it has two parts to it. This quantity over here is first, it's the maximum possible, maximum uh, information capacity Uh, capacity if 
and it's important to have if error rate is to be small. And I'll just put small in quotes. And second, there exists a code, there exists a channel coder. In other words, some choice of px, there exists a coder such that this rate is achieved. Okay, and it doesn't tell you what that coder is, but there exists such a coder. Okay, so it's like a challenge. Okay, there's a code, go find it. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? I'm just repeating basically what I talked about last time. So any questions about this so far? Okay, so now uh, I'm going to sketch the proof of uh, Shannon's, uh, Shannon's theorem and the, this, the proof sketch is a paragraph here, but the actual proof is about you know, 10, 15 pages of very complicated math. Uh, however, it turns out that we can understand the proof without too much trouble okay, if we, fall, if we, if we uh, use the following figure, which really should be in the book, but it's not. Okay, but I'm going, to show, I'm going to draw it for you. So we start with two assumptions about x. We assume that x is, um, uh, th that I should say the, uh, not the x, but the uh, symbols that are being sent over here, so that the symbols are being sent are iid. And the iid with distribution, uh, with the distribution obviously being p of x. Okay, so the iid assumption is not quite true. Remember, we have, let's say symbols are English alphabet, and we're sending a q. Well, we know u is going to follow almost surely, right? But we're going to assume that you know, any character follow can follow Q. So QX or QY is just as likely as QU. Okay? And of course, that's not true. But well, we're going to have to make the simplification. Otherwise, we can't get any results. So we're going to make this assumption. And the second assumption we're going to make is that we're going to consider message sequences, or I should say symbol sequences. Of, that's not an assumption yet, it's just simple sequence of length n, but the assumption is that n tends to infinity. So in other words, you're looking at arbitrary long message sequences. Okay, so that's the assumption we're going to make. We look at asymptotically large message sequences rather than small message sequences. And this is super important as well. Okay. So those are fairly straightforward assumptions. So let's see what the what the story is. The story is like this. I'm going to take one such input message sequence. So on the le over here, I'm going to basically show a, a se sorry, symbol sequence, symbol sequence of length n, okay, which is distributed as p of x, where each symbol is distributed as p of x. So I just write that that, that means p of x. So here's my first symbol sequence. And then here's another one. I'm just drawing these as dots, okay? Now, this, these dots are what I'm going to put over here, okay? Now, what is the channel going to do to my symbol sequence? It's going to cause trouble, okay? So let's say I put the symbol sequence 0, 0, 0, 0 for the sake of argument. Well, some of these zeros are going to get through, but some of them are going to become 1. So I'm going to get an output of 0, 0, 1, 0 perhaps, or 0, 1, 1, 1. I don't know. Depends on what the channel is doing, okay? But certainly we know that this symbol sequence over here can be, can result in any one of a number of uh, different output sequences, okay, depending on the channel, what the channel is doing to it. So if I have 0, 0, 0, 0, I can have basically any number of, uh, any number of these output sequences. However, some of these output sequences are more likely than others. So for example, if I were to send this symbol sequence 0, 0, 0, 0, sorry, okay, then in this set over here, the output sequence 0, 0, 0, 1 is much likelier than, I should probably write it like this, p greater than probability of 1, 1, 1, 1, because 1, 1, 1, 1 requires 
me to have all four bits to be corrupted. Okay? Whereas 0, 0, 0, 1, only one has to be corrupted. So this set, of course, you can say every bit could be corrupted, but the total number of corruptions, okay, if the probability of 0 to 1 corruption is p over here, for example, if I, want, if I have a sequence of length n, for all of them to be corrupted, it's going to have probability p to the n, which is kind of low. Okay? So inside here, there are some sequences that are likely and the other sequences that are not likely. The unlikely, okay. So, so we can kind of look at those and say, okay, uh, uh, can we characterize this? And we start thinking about where did we see this before? That we have some likely things and some unlikely things. Oh yeah, we saw that in typical sets. We saw that one consequence of the weak law of large numbers is the asymptotic equ equipartition property, which says that when we have a, a distribution of sequences, some sequences are more likely than others. And in fact, what did we remember? If you remember it, it said as the symbol sequence tends to infinity, as n tends to infinity, which you have conveniently assumed over here, things get more and more typical. Okay? Not in terms of the actual message, but the distribution of symbols. So for example, 0, 0, 0, 1, sorry, or 0, 1, 1, 0 is more typical than 0, 0, 0, 0, for example, because, you know, that's from the binomial theorem, you're going to have, if you're four, equi you know, you're going to have two out of four is more likely than zero out of four. Okay. So, uh, so we have that equipartition property, and we can apply that twice. We can apply the equipartition property first here and then there. And how do you apply it over here? What we say over here is that as we are going to make n grow larger and larger, this strings that we have over here are going to be typical. In fact, the only strings we need to consider that are being sent on this channel are typical strings, typical symbol sequences. If it's atypical, forget it, because the fraction of atypical sequences is less than any epsilon that I care. Remember the AEP says that I can choose the n large enough so that the uh, atypical sequences are going to be below any threshold that we care, okay? And uh, okay. so that's, that's so, so we know that, all right? So, so that's good. So we have essentially got a characterization of the input and we're going to say, I'm only going to consider typical sequences. So people who are coming in 10, 15 minutes late, you're missing all this stuff, okay, that I'm talking about. So it's not really very helpful. You may as well stay outside and you know, come back in the next class or watch it on video. I mean, you're always late. It's only one more class, but seriously, you know, consider which bus you're taking or walking or whatever. All right, so what Shannon says is that let's look at only the typical sequences over here, which we can characterize because the typical sequences look like the mean of the distribution, okay? They look like, the, if we have the distribution over here, and this is what happens. As you get n gets larger and larger, we get sharper and sharper, so we can just look at essentially the mean of the distribution, and that's pretty well defined. So as you take n to infinity, we have to look at just the typical set, and the typical set is well defined. So we go from this infinite space of all possible sequences to just the typical sequences, and moreover, we kind of know what the entropy of that is. The entropy of this is going to be essentially given by h of x. The typical sequence has an intrinsic entropy of h of x, okay? We know that from the asymptotic equipartition property. So now we can characterize this input. And that's a really brilliant insight right here, which is that most input strings for n long enough are typical. Okay? And that's one, one building block of the theorem, which sort of Shannon figured out. Okay? So, so this is really super, super important. It's not the least bit obvious. Not the least bit obvious. Remember, we are talking about billboards and radio and TV and stuff like that. So somebody comes and says, what's the entropy of all TV shows? What Shannon does is first he goes into symbols, and then from symbols, he looks at the distribution of symbols, assuming their IID, which is an assumption, but okay, you know, if you grant him IID, then he can tell you, yeah, the typical TV program, <laughs> it looks like this, okay, as, this, as a symbol sequence goes to infinity, it has an entropy of h of x, and that is characteristic of that source, and you know, I can characterize that purely from that h of x over here. Okay? So, and, and where is h of x coming from? It's coming from p of x, which is coming from the symbol sequences, and as we saw earlier, we can get p of x 
by considering larger and larger corpuses of text or corpora of text or symbols or movie shows and looking at symbol frequencies when you can find out P of X. And from P of X you get H of X. From H of X we know the typical message. Okay. So, so far so good? Okay. Now, the second step is to say, okay, I'm taking this typical sequence, I'm going to push it to the channel, and it's going to come out here. Each typical message is going to get distorted. However, we can get to have typical distortions as well. You're going to have typical distortions as well. And so a typical message is going to have some elements in this set which are likely, and the other things which are not likely. Okay, because they need too many things. As you saw in this example over here, this probability of this symbol output sequence is much more likely than this one. So we can mathematically look at that as well and see what happens. And what Shannon showed was that if this input sequence has length n, then the size of this set is going to be 2 to the power n h of y given x. Okay. That's the size of this set, 2 to the n h y given x. And uh, you can kind of intuitively see what's going on is that uh, the, the, the h of y given x is sort of the, uh, is, is the uh, probability of, or sorry, the entropy of y knowing what x is. So we know what x is because we started over here. And the uncertainty in y is kind of the how much variation there is in y if I know what x is. Right? So I know what x is, and it goes to the channel, and then there's going to be some uncertainty in what the output is, and that uncertainty is captured by h of y given x, and because that is going to be typical, okay, we know that the size of this set is going to be 2 to the n h y given x. Okay? Or we can similarly state that the typical uh, message in this set has an entropy of h of y given x. It's another way of looking at it, but, you can show, but what Shannon actually showed was the size of this set is 2 to the n uh, h by given x. So that's the first thing. The second thing he showed was that all of these uh, sets over here uh, are, 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 equally, are equally likely. And third, these are non-overlapping. Okay. So this equally likely and non-overlapping are not intuitive, so I'm not going to uh, go through that because it, it gets somewhat uh, uh, crazy. But this part is what I wanted to fi uh, uh, fix on over here. So if we just look at that, then what we can say then is that the, uh, and, and sorry, and then the other thing is showed is the total number of, the total number of messages is given by 2 to the power n h of y, again, typically. Typically, the total number of output messages given by that. So, so what we can say then is that how do we get decoding, okay, probably, pro uh, properly? And the way we get decoding properly is like this: we take this uh, this set over here, and we want to make sure that they all map to just one over here. Okay, and we take this whole thing over here, they all map to just one over here, and we're never going to go from here to this. Okay? So in other words, if I can confine all my output symbols to be in this region of space, which are different from the output symbols generated from this one, then when I see one of these, I can say, yeah, it probably came from here. Okay? If you remember back to our, 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 our uh, QAM codes, let's say that we have these four codes over here, okay? And what happens is that due to channel uh, distortion, what actually happens is that I get something like this, okay? But this is sort of in this space within that one, and let's say this is the space within that one where I'm showing the, the quadrature and the amplitude. So if I look at this, I say, oh yeah, I got that. That's most likely that, okay? So that's so everything in this space in terms of quadrature and amplitude, phase and amplitude, I'll say it really means that. That's really what's going on over here. So everything that's in this space, I say really means this, okay? And if I can have these non-overlapping, just a moment, if I have these non-overlapping, then I'm going to be able to decode almost surely, okay, without any, with vanishingly small error probability. But if I don't, if I don't, if I keep these overlapping, then what will happen is 
that I'm going to have difficulty figuring out what the input was. And it's like saying that if I have uh, this code space like this, then when I get this, I don't know that it goes here or goes there. Okay, So I have this problem over here. So I want to make sure that the uh, distortions are separated from each other in these sets over here. So yes. Symbol sequence. Symbol sequence. Correct. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So, so we view uh, Shannon's proof as constructive to the extent that it says what we want to do is to ensure that despite channel distortions, each typical symbol sequence is going to be mapped to a non-overlapping set. And then we're going to make sure that these are all equally likely from each other. Okay. That's basically what you're trying to do over here. Now it's an equally likely because you know these are all equally likely, typical sets, right? So and the channel is is oblivious. It's a non. Uh, there's no there's no history to it, right? It's a memoryless channel. So because it's memoryless, the equi equally likely is easy. The non-overlapping is sort of by design. Non-overlapping is like saying I want to spread these apart so that I can go backwards. And what Shannon says is that if I do that, okay. If I do that, well, I have 2 to the n h y is the total number of messages that we possibly have. And I want to break them up into sets which are, uh, which are of size 2 n h y given x, right? So that means that the sender, so how many, symbol, how many messages can, a symbol send, can the sender send? So the sender should send at most 2 to the n h of y over 2 to the n h uh, y given x. Okay, So what is this ratio? This ratio is basically this whole space divided by this space and that corresponds to the number of points over here. And if those if the sender is willing to confine themselves to just these many messages, this ratio of number of messages, life is good. I can just I can figure it out. Despite the channel doing whatever it's doing, why? Because I'm going to have certain. I only only have. The, I'm going to have only those many distinct points. They're all equally likely because they all belong to this typical set, and the elements of the typical set are equally likely. They're all getting distorted, but when they distort. I'm going to make sure they're non-overlapping. When this happens, I know that I can figure out backwards what's going on. And moreover, and this is the important part, if you don't do this, you're in trouble. If you don't do this, if you choose this so that they overlap, let's say that these are overlapping like so, then when something is over here, I don't know whether I should go here or I should go there. And so the error probability is not going to be vanishingly small. Okay, so in order to keep the error probability vanishingly small, it's necessary for me to make them non-overlapping. Okay, so the proof then is actually not that hard to figure out. First, you show that the, the, the messages here are typical. Then you show that every typical message is going to be translated into a, a, a set of messages and that the typical set of the size of this is going to be 2 to the n h y given x. In other words, there are going to be messages which are going to be overlapping because they're atypical. Okay, but the probability of those atypical sets is so, so, so small. Probability of an atypical simple sequence is so small, just forget it. Just pretend it's not there, right? And then you have to only show one, you have to show that the entropy of this typical set is 2 to the n h y given x. Okay, that's a very straightforward proof. And then you have to show that the total number of possible output symbols, again, typical symbols, is 2 to the n h y. So you always are working with typical sets. And so then this is straightforward r r ratio. Okay? And then we get that if the sender can send at most this many symbols for decoding, and here is our almost surely. AS, and that's the thing I said shows up. Almost surely meaning that, uh, you know, the probability that you cannot decode is going to go smaller than any epsilon that you care to name, right? I can choose n large enough so that that can be decoded almost surely, okay? 
So any questions on this? Because the last little bit is just trivial, but I want to get make sure this this, this is clear. Yeah. So so we're going from here to here to mapping. Okay. So once we get this, then basically we are almost home. All we need to do is take that ratio. That ratio is basically nothing more than two to the n i x y. Okay, because h y minus h x y going to x is the same as the mutual information says this. And see, this is because of n symbols. So for each symbol, okay, we can the source can uh, uh, the source we can sort of attribute. Maybe I should say uh, contribution. Okay, so these are all uh, 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 e equally likely messages. So the contribution of each symbol is going to be divided by n, and we take the logarithm of this uh, is going to be just i, x, y. Okay. Wh why do we say this? Well, the n symbols, right? And so each symbol is. Uh, so we can also look at it this way. There, are, this is the total number two to the n i x y is this size over here. This is the total number of messages. Okay. 2 to the n i x y that can be sent and be decoded almost surely, right? That's what I just said because that's just this one of your sender should send at most these many messages for decoding almost surely. So that's the size of this set, okay? So when we have n equiprobable, uh, or 2 to the k equiprobable messages, what's the uh, what's the en entropy of that? It's going to be uh, the log of that. So that's n i, I, n I x y. Each symbol is going to be one nth of that, so it's i x y bits. Okay, and so this is the sort of the entropy that can be sent per symbol. Okay, over here, and we 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 remember that the, in a noiseless channel, when we had a capacity c symbols per second. Okay, then we said that, and if we had k as being the uh, 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 bits per symbol, then the capacity is kc symbols per second. So here we're saying that the bits per symbol is i x y, so that corresponds to basically the capacity in bits per symbol. So that's really contribution each symbol, and so this we view as we view that as being the channel capacity per symbol. Because that's basically how many bits are being sent with each symbol. Yeah, that's that's in a noiseless channel. We're sending, let's say, you know, sixteen quam sixteen. We're sending four bits per symbol. Here we're sending i x y bits per symbol. So we can view that as being the information rate corresponding to each symbol, and that in fact is the Shannon rate. Go over the theorem one more time, and. Uh, because this sort of is the heart of information theory. Pretty much everything in information theory depends on the techniques and the results of this theorem over here. So let me re remind you, we have source that's sending through source coder, channel coder, and we have some symbol, uh, uh, set of symbols, from which is the domain of the random variable x, which are distributed according to px, and we already saw how in practice we can actually approximate px, so we know that. Okay, we want to compute the maximum information rate that we can send on the uh, information capacity that of the channel, of a, of a noisy channel, if the error rate is to be small, and, and we want to, and we want to sh you know, and Shannon also said there exists a coder, I'll come to that in a minute, how he comes to that, exists a coder. I haven't talked about that at all, if the rate is achieved, and then the, the theorem says it's going to be the maximum IXY for some PX. So that's 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 the Shannon theorem. So I'll come back to the uh, this in just a minute once I go over the steps in the in the proof. So we start with uh, message sequences, which are with, uh, sorry symbol sequences, where the symbols are iid and the symbol sequences of length n. And the first step is to think, is to show that if it's not typical, we don't care about it. Okay, just forget about it. So we have all typical 
And if they're all typical, they're all equally likely as well because that's uh, this is very narrow set of messages which will become typical. And all sequences, if you have lo long enough sequence length, they will become typical. The second thing is to show that we are going, the noisy channel is going to map each message to a set of messages and that the set of messages is going to have an, uh, a, a, a typical value and the, uh, so it's going to have a typical message as well and that the entropy of this is given by 2 to the n h y given x, okay, and that's going to tell us sort of the size of this set over here and that these sets are equally likely because these are equally likely. The third step is to show that there's as many, uh, the total number of messages you can have is 2 to the n h y and so in order for us to have decoding almost surely, we have to make sure that this, this, these sets are non-overlapping and that will be true if 2 to the n h y, I'm sorry, if the number of messages here is less than this ratio to the n h y divided by 2 to the uh, n h y given x. So if the number of messages you sent is less than this, then life is good. Okay, we can decode it. So that's so far. So good. And that ratio is just nothing more than that ratio is more is, is two to the n i x y because it's in you know that that that's the that's sort of here we have over here. And we can then view this as having the contribution of each symbol being i x y bits. Okay? And we call that the channel capacity per symbol. Okay. So let's come back to the theorem now. So we are saying that the maximum information capacity is this maximization of px ixy. So this ixy is the uh, capacity for some hx. Okay, if I have some hx and some typical set, this is the capacity. But I haven't told you what is the maximum possible information capacity. That will happen when we tune the hx so that this ixy is maximized. Okay, so no matter what your hx is, I'm going to have some capacity corresponding to that, okay? Which is given by i x y. That's just that's what this says, okay? But if I want to know the maximum capacity, I'm going to take the maximization of all p x's because these are all that's going to decide what's going to be typical, etc. And so this must therefore be the maximum capacity of the channel, no matter what you do, and that's what we get as the maximum capacity. Okay, so it's a maximization over this particular uh, uh, this particular uh, value over here, and so I should say maximum information in capacity in bits per symbol. That's the part I didn't say. Now I haven't said about the coder. What coder did we use to get this maximum capacity? So uh, how, how do we know such a coder exists? So what Shannon said was that he actually looked at the uh, 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 at this value, this maximization, uh, looking at the space of all random coders. Okay, so he said, let's just take all possible random coders. And so, what does it mean to a random coder? Well, what the random coder is going to do is that it's going to give you these PMFs, probability mass functions of HX, which are which are random. We really don't know, okay, what it is. And he said that if you take the space of all possible random coders, it will turn out that even if you just use a random coder and n is large enough, it, you will achieve this capacity. Okay. And that's a bizarre kind of result. It doesn't tell you what this is. This is just like a random coder and you'll find this capacity for long enough sequences. And he said if a random coder can do it, then there must exist, in there must exist some coder which can achieve as good a rate as a random coder. So if you take all possible random codes, long enough sequences, so, uh, you know, so if, 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 I, if I tell you that if I pick a random person in a room, okay, and they have a height of something, right, 175 centimeters, there must be at least one person with that height because, you know, I picked a random person basically to do this. And so the, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not being as subtle as Shannon in saying this. That's not exactly true, but that's roughly along the lines of this. So he did not actually have to tell you what the coder is. It just showed that if a random thing must have it, then one coder must have it. And that shows that there exists a coder such that this rate is achieved. Again, but it's not constrained. It doesn't tell you which one it is. Okay. And this is similar to uh, another famous proof, which was done by Nash in the 1950s for the Nash equilibrium in game theory. So there exists some equilibrium solution. Okay, but I won't tell you what it is, it just exists, right? So these kinds of existence proofs 
typically come from uh, fixed point theorems which shows there must exist a fixed point for this function. This is not a fixed point theorem. This is saying there's an ensemble and the ensemble has this property which means 